That was a rabbit hole. That was fun. Yeah. Where speaking of speaking of it? Tim, why don't we toss it over to him now? Yeah, Tim, get some space got? news. Yeah. Let's talk space. Hey guys, uh, I'm sure as you know, I am on my way down to Kennedy Space Center to capture SpaceX. Uh, they're in flight abort test, which is going to be awesome. And I am road tripping. Uh, I'm gonna be down there with my family for some vacation. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to share uh, some of my, a little bit of, it's gonna be a, a hybrid, a little bit of road tripping. You can kind of uh, come along with me and experience what it's like to supercharge a little bit here and there and you know, all the fun adventures, just a little. And then we're also, while I'm supercharging at one point, we're actually gonna sit and I'm gonna go through the news with you guys. So uh, there's a few fun items that I wanted to talk about this week in space. So uh, so we're gonna kind of pop back and forth between a few different things here. So, all right, here we go. So I wanted to show you guys some real world, uh, firsthand experience, I think, with, uh, this is gonna be our first time actually using proper V3 chargers at a really low state of charge. So I'm only at 7% right now, so. I'm really excited to see how this actually ends up uh, charging. So let's let's see what we can actually get here in real world, real world conditions, working my way on the 1400 mile trip down to Florida. Let's see what kind of charge rates we can actually get. Cause this could be absolutely game changing. Vehicle battery very low, of course. Let's see how these things are doing. Now there was a little warning uh, on the nav that said these are not performing optimally, but believe it or not some people from Nashville told me that it's looking good So there we go plugged in the uh, supercharger. You can tell this is a v3 because it has the thinner cable um, And so it's actually a liquid cooled cable, which is pretty slick. But let's pop in here and see how it's doing Let's see if it's Okay, here we go starting at 120 that's what a V2 will do. A V2 can get up to about 150 um, at peak times. Um, and I'm looking at that the number being the kilowatt hour there. So um, we'll see if this actually kicks into like full blown, um, you know, full blown supercharging speeds. Um, or at, this might be limited to, to V2 speeds right now, which is maybe why it would show up um, on the nav as being like, what did it say actually? When I looked at this, it says, if you click on this right now, the nav says, um, hmm, it did say earlier that, uh, yeah, I don't remember what it said, but let's just take a look here and see if, there we go, 150, 155. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, look at that. Now we're talking. 180, 190, I've, I don't think I've actually really seen charging rates this fast before. Okay, this is insane. <laughs> oh man, look at that. We've already gained three kilowatts hours of bat, three kilowatt hours of battery charge so far. So, wow, if these are deployed on road trips everywhere, I mean, game over. Because look, I've already gained, yeah. I mean, I'm just sitting here charging at almost a thousand miles an hour, that's 1600 kilometers in an hour. And so 20 minutes will get you, you know, a third of that. So um, yeah, that's why, although, you know, remember it tapers off. So as we get closer to around 50%, you'll see your charge rate start to decline. Um, and the closer you get to 100% after that, it just really, really gets down to a tr slow trickle, just like your cell phones do. That's just a byproduct of lithium ion but you know here we are looking at getting <laughs> uh you know sustaining pretty close to 900 miles per hour which again you know for 20 minutes we should get pretty you know a pretty high rate of charge i don't actually need too much tonight um as you can see by the clock here it's 120 in the morning um and i'm i'm only about 20 more miles from my hotel so i'm um, sorry 30 two kilometers or whatever from my hotel. Uh, so I just have a little bit further to go. So I'm just gonna make sure I've got enough to get there. And then I will be charging there tonight. So that's, so I'll wake up to a totally full car this morning, which is awesome. Um, that helps tomorrow's final leg of the trip um, speed up quite a bit. How much further do we have? Navigate to Kennedy Space Center. I mean, that's close enough. I'm not actually going straight there, but 
it still gives you a good sense of how far it is. So 630 miles is what it said. So if I were just to keep going tonight, um, I would have 14 more hours of charge time or 14 more hours of drive time. I mean, sorry. No, nope, 11 hours. That's not bad. And don't forget, like I said, I'll wake up to a full charge. So I should not that'd be great if I only had about 11 hours of driving. That'd be amazing, actually. So there you go. That is the update. Uh, already at 20%. <laughs> that's, that's insane. That's just so weird. I mean, I know it's still not, you know, gasoline charging fast, you know, as fast as uh, throwing in some gasoline, some petrol or diesel or whatever. And I know it's not quite the same speeds, but as far as going on a road trip, if you were, you know, plugging in, you go into the convenience store near you, you go, you, you know, you, you pee, you do whatever you need. By the time you come out, you're probably already good enough to continue on with your trip. Um, you know, if you take a five or 10 minute break and if these are starting to get closer and closer grouped together, especially V3s like this, you know, you don't want to be filling up to the top. You want to be going and pulling in, like I pulled in at what was that? 7%, six or 7%. That's ideal. If you can, if you can get around there every time you pull in, that's like a dream come true. So, um, yeah, so that's pretty fun. So I'll update you guys again here. Um, and maybe I'll just keep doing a little bit of this. And, uh, yeah, and I'll try to bring you some, I'll, I'll bring you some space news tomorrow too while I charge. This is going to be, this is going to be what you get from me for, uh, our ludicrous future this week, I guess. Okay. Got a little, couple uh, hours of sleep here. And, uh, oh, I guess they didn't realize that Dodge came out with the electrical vehicles. I didn't realize that, but, uh, here's what it's like. So, uh, in general, you know, when you're traveling like this cross country, you know, I end up always booking a hotel that has a charger. So I wake up to the car being, you know, charged, which is amazing. And uh, yeah, so that it's one of those things. It's, it helps offset the, the inconvenience to wake up to a car that's fully charged so you can get your first 300 miles without stopping if you want in the morning. I'm one of those people, I like to stop every two hours, at least every two hours, because otherwise, you know, otherwise I just get bored. <laughs> and like my back hurts and stuff if I'm sitting too long. So I like to get up about every two hours and charge for, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Not a Never mind the mess, never mind the all the mambos that I'm eating up there. Not a big deal. Okay, so I have to admit, it's been probably a decade since I've eaten these and I didn't remember that they're called mambas and not mambos. So leave it out of the comment section. I don't want to hear it. Okay, so I just had some lunch in Atlanta while supercharging and it <laughs> supercharged like too fast for me to even finish eating lunch. And so I'm going to be showing you guys some space news here quick um, on the screen of the Tesla. So I've got the web browser pulled up here and let's just go ahead and clear that out. And uh, if you're listening, I'm sorry, this is gonna be a very visual experience, but uh, I'm gonna go to space flight now. And I'm gonna show you guys a little article because we have a lot of updates here. Um, Starliner had a big week actually, if you guys remember, of course, uh, Starliner is Boeing's spacecraft that flew um, just a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago or so. Had the anomaly, as we all know, the timer anomaly. But here's the cool thing, is they released um, some in-cabin videos. So this was really cool. I'm really glad they did this because, <laughs> I I'm glad they did this because they provided literally no decent video or anything beforehand, um, you know, bef or during the actual flight. They didn't do any real, like, streaming. As a matter of fact, we didn't even get any, like, footage after stage separation of the vehicle at all. It was really disappointing, but lucky for us guys, they actually gave us some really good views of launch, including, I've always wanted to see this. Look at that, there's there's actually liftoff. You can see the towers clearing. Um, it's a really cool video, definitely check this out. They posted it to YouTube, very high quality. You see uh, Rosie, their onboard test flight dummy, hanging out. I just thought this was really cool. Um, and I'm really glad that they even showed um, some thruster firings during the actual anomaly, which uh, good for them. They even like brought it up, 
I don't know. I'm just, I was, I was happy by this amount of transparency. This is what I think we kind of need to see. See thruster firings after timing anomaly. They show what it would have looked like in the cabin. And it kind of, it helped clear a little bit of, of, you know, people's fears saying like, oh, you know, thruster anomaly. It sounds like a scary thing, but really it was just some thrusters kind of going toot toot every now and then. Um, and again, if there were an astronaut in the seat, they would have easily been able to correct it. So good for Boeing for providing some transparency and and showing, you know, what it, what looked like on orbit. You know, it only spent two days in space instead of a full week, but still they got a lot of data back. And, they even, and then most importantly, as we know, they did re-entry and touchdown. And the views of it on touchdown is actually awesome. Um, well, re-entry is amazing. Of course, you can see um, the plasma glowing outside of the windows. Really cool footage to check out. So again, if you're listening to this, uh, first I apologize about the quality. It probably sounds a little tinny compared to normal. But uh, second, you definitely have to get on YouTube and check out the video they released. They just, they did a, a really good job of showing us more video and more footage of the things that we wanna see. So thank you, Boeing, for releasing this footage. I thought this was awesome. Definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, but here's Touchdown, check out Touchdown. It really looks pretty gentle for being a land landing. Uh, when you watch Soyuz touchdown, it really does look more like a car crash compared to this. So uh, good job Boeing. But that's actually not all for Boeing news because this week they held a press conference um, and actually invited the press out to see Starliner after it came back. So remember it touched down um, some weeks ago and you know they've now got it all the way back to Kennedy Space Center after landing in New Mexico and they're doing some checks and the, the news is starting to come out that it's actually performed better than expected or at least I guess kind of on the upper levels of, of expectations as far as um, refurbishment because they are planning to totally refly this vehicle and in doing so um, you know obviously you have to do some refurbishment and, and checkouts and all these things afterwards so the, basically the moral of the story is it came back and is looking really good. And because of that, um, Boeing feels like they're they're gonna be on schedule to be able to, to reuse the spacecraft on the second crewed launch. And that's great news. We want to see more of that. We want, you know, we, in my opinion, I always want things to be moving forward and progressing. And obviously refurbishment plans and refurbishment being as good or like on the upper levels of what you're expecting is is definitely, definitely good news. I guess this is just going to be a Boeing episode <laughs> for me because obviously, you know, I'm going to be talking way too much about SpaceX here um, next week uh, when I get done with the in-flight abort test stuff. So there's going to be already too much of that from me. And, and there's actually a decent amount of Boeing news because we actually have some good promising progress for SLS arriving at Stennis Space Center to do what they're calling the Green Run Campaign. And my friends at NASAspaceflight.com have a really good article on this um, that you guys should definitely check out. Um, but basically, they're, they're going to be doing, this is like the same thing as when SpaceX does a static fire. They're doing that with SLS. And last year they are considering skipping the whole Green Run process and not even bothering uh, to actually do a green run or, or a static fire. And they opted to do it because they thought it'd be a good validation of all the systems. And so um, they took it by barge and got it to Stennis this week and are starting to begin. They, they had a Pathfinder vehicle that was there to test how to crane and how to maneuver and how to get it installed. That was basically just a giant mock-up. And now this is the actual core and this is the core that's going to fly. So hopefully everything goes really well because this is going to be used for the first uncrewed Artemis mission. Um, this is core stage one and it's going to be firing for that full like eight minute duration. So it's really, really gonna be taking a beating, really doing, you know, being put through its paces. This is good news. Um, unfortunately, this is where you can see the difference between SpaceX and Boeing because this process will likely take until uh, July or August to fire SLS. So, so think about that because SpaceX, it, it feels more like when it's, when it's a, a mission like this with NASA, there's all these procedures and before they even write up the proce procedures, they'll literally like make a test version of it and then write up more procedures and procedures and test everything. It gets to the point where, you know, something like this, just to fuel up a rocket will take 
almost six months likely and it won't be leaving the testing so we'll hopefully see it fire before then but then to actually leave the testing and get put back in the barge and heading out to kennedy space center they're saying at best basically late summer you know it's a different timeline but then again spacex would likely say we're going to do it in a month and it might take to the end of summer and the difference is spacex will literally just like learn on the fly and then just be like here we're just gonna i don't know just grab a crane i don't know hey you over there uh, come over here we're gonna move this and they just kind of do things and it's different philosophies at the end of the day, I'm just really, really happy to actually see some hardware for a rocket that's literally destined for the moon. Um, that's really cool, in my opinion. And seeing, you know, again, you guys know me, I'm a huge, I'm a huge Starship fan, but seeing an actual rocket uh, getting ready to do some full scale testing is always a good, I mean, this is equivalent to if they did a booster, you know, a Starship booster test, basically. Think of it as that. So that's that's how far along start, uh, SLS is in development. I know it's taken a long time in, in develop to get to this point, but but to compare it to Starship, it'd be like if SpaceX were testing the full core booster, you know, a full super heavy booster um, and not just the upper stage Starship. So that's kind of like what this is. And so seeing progress on this is a very, very good thing in my opinion. Um, I'm ready to see that thing fly. I, I wanna see that thing fly. Well guys, uh, that's gonna do it for me. Uh, I'm going to keep heading down to Kennedy Space Center. Gotta get there tonight. We have to pick up press badges tomorrow. There's a press conference tomorrow and set up pad cameras and all that stuff and also do some kind of testing of my live stream setup. So I gotta keep going, keep heading on the road. Um, thank you guys for tuning in, but I'll pass it back off to the other guys. And I should definitely point out that this is not normal. This is not how you'd normally charge on a road trip. Don't do this. I just had to get this news out so I could get it on time so our editor, Ben, could handle this episode. This is not what I would normally do. Normally you fill this vehicle, you know, when you're charging on the road trips, 50 to 60% to get you to like the next, you know, skip a supercharger and get down to that one almost empty. So this is gonna be unusual. Don't judge me. Don't leave comments about how this is bad charging habits and, and inefficient and dumb. I know, <laughs> I'm just trying to get, uh, get this out to you guys so it can be out in a timely manner. So that's why, there you have it. Hey, thanks for checking us out, guys. I hope you enjoyed this clip from our podcast. We do a weekly show here on YouTube, so make sure and subscribe to Our Ludicrous Future, where we discuss all the things that are going to make our future totally ludicrous. You can join us here on YouTube or at any of your favorite podcast places. Plus, if you want to get some behind-the-scenes stuff and join a cool community, you can help support the channel at patreon.com. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys.